Okay, and now we're going to move on to performance, gesture, blocking, and staging. Um, so I want to start by turning to Victor Perkins' The World and Its Image, um, from which I excerpted a small portion that I wanted you to read. Mostly what I want to do with Victor Perkins is just a good example of film analysis, especially the kind of formal analysis um, that uh, we talked about uh, last time, um, and especially the kind of analysis that might be advocated by um, Susan Sontag, and I think is a good model for the kind of writing um, that we should think about doing in this class. So Victor Perkins writes, a single image is made to act both as a recording to show us what happens and as an expressive device to heighten the effect and significant significance of what we see. In other words, it's important to keep in mind not only the what we see, but the how it's shown. So this should resonate a lot with uh, what Susan Sontag was saying. We must learn to see more, to hear more, to feel more. The function of criticism should be to show how it is, what it is, even that it is what it is, rather than to show what it means. Um, so I just want to look at one example of um, Perkins is writing and to kind of dissect what he's doing well as a good model for um, how to integrate formal observation with um, meaningful interpretation. And not the kind of interpretation that would say substitute one thing for another that Sontag talks about, but an er interpretation that is um, in close alignment with what the film is, uh, is doing and showing through formal means. So uh, this is a clip from the film uh, called Marnie um, by Hitchcock, the same director as Rear Window. Um, and in order to understand what's going on in this clip, um, all you need to understand is that the uh, titular character, Marnie, um, has an uh, unexplained um, traumatic reaction to the color uh, red. Put on the overhead light if you like. The switch is by the door. Why don't you sit down, Mrs. Taylor? If the storm worries you that much, I'll get you something to drink. Mrs. Taylor? Grounded, Mrs. Taylor. You're quite safe here. From the lightning. The colors. Stop the colors. What colors? So I'm going to stop the clip there. Um, when you watch this clip um, out of context from the film, you might be thinking uh, a few things about it. You might be thinking, oh, this is a bit over the top. It's a bit melodramatic. Um, I can tell that the uh, special effects are, are a bit hokey. Um, that The music is a bit um, over the top. Um, but I want us to kind of suspend our judgment of its, um, uh, its, uh, its maybe failed attempt at, at a realism and think about the way that Victor Perkins reads it as aligned with the meanings that the film is invested in. So let's, let's work through what uh, Perkins says about it. So he begins by saying that the film provides a fine instance of the way in which action can be molded at the same time invisibly and to precise effect. And he looks at this um, rather what we would think of as unremarkable uh, gesture that signifies um, her fear of, of the lightning. But he looks at it in a very particular way. He says, twice at moments of crisis, Hitchcock's heroine turns her face towards a wall and clings to it as if trying to absorb herself into its fabric. At first sight, this gesture seems to be only what it undoubtedly is, an extremely skillful way of conveying to the spectator the full measure of Marnie's panic, right? That it just seems to be um, uh, a not that significant um, uh, conveyance of information that she's afraid. But, and this is where his claim gets interesting and starts getting tied to a meaningful interpretation, he says, but 
but more closely examined, the gesture takes us to the heart of her character and directs us to the film's central theme. We see that the action is a very childish one, closely analogous to hiding one's head in one's mother's skirt, and is related to a childish belief. The underlying assumption is that by making oneself blind, one becomes invisible, that one cannot be harmed by something that one refuses to see. And we can support Perkins' analysis by returning to this moment in the film um, when uh, Marnie uh, visits her mother and learns about the source of her trauma attached to the color red and, and uh, other sorts of trauma that are kind of unexplained in the film. And she does that very thing. Um, that Perkins says is similar in structure to the way she ab tries to absorb herself in the walls. The creation of the significant gesture, Perkins says here, serves to show what I mean by the invisible effect. The spectator can be un can understand the action of the sequence without becoming aware of the device as relevant comment. It does not demand interpretation, but if he does examine the device and relate it to his knowledge of the heroine, the significance of the moment is enhanced. In other words, what Perkins is trying to say is that there's nothing about Marnie's gesture that says, interpret me. It doesn't seem like a vague, um, uh, a strange moment of surrealism in a film that asks us to uh, to interpret it, it actually seems natural to the conveyance of narrative and characterization. But he's saying it's not enough to simply uh, point that out. Um, we have uh, a duty to think about the specificity of it. And I just want to highlight certain aspects of his writing as, as, uh, as useful models for what we can do here. Notice his usage of particular verbs um, and similes uh, and adjectives to convey that there is more in the gesture than uh, simply a superficial content-based description might, uh, might, might give us. So she, uh, he says that, the, that Marnie turns her face towards a wall and clings to it, as if trying to absorb herself into its fabric. The use of, the use of similes here, as if this, is really useful, and I almost want you to try it out in your own writing. Um, the simile is a way of saying that a particular bit of form has this other element in it, even if it's not literally that thing. It's not as if she's literally trying to absorb herself into its fabric. This is a way of trying to convey the specificity of the gesture by use of figurative language. Again, he says that it's a childish gesture. Analogous, which is another way of saying as if, trying to hide one's head in one's mother's skirt. Once again, he's not saying she's literally doing this, but he's conveying the specificity of the gesture by way of comparison. Um, and then he actually explains why that gesture is childish. He says, by making oneself blind, one becomes invisible, that one cannot be harmed by something that one refuses to see. It's a childish belief when you're playing hide and go seek that if I put my hands over my eyes, you can't see me. We grow out of that kind of childish belief. And he's saying there's something about that that marks the specificity of Marnie's gesture. And I want us to just think about the degree to which Perkins is elaborating on something very, very small, um, a gesture of performance. And I want us to try to do something similar in uh, this opening shot of Marie Antoinette. <laughs> Okay, that's very, very short, right? And it's only one shot. It's barely one gesture, um, but it conveys a lot of information. So I just want us to try to do the Perkins thing of elaborating on uh, the specificity of, of the performance and also a little bit of the mise-en-scene that's involved. So the first thing we might notice is that Marie is reclining right? Um, reclining is a kind of gesture that conveys privilege and wealth. Um, it, it, it suggests to us that she has the privilege of, of leisure, um, of, of, of not doing labor. Um, also, this little head rotation that she does right there. Um, it's important, right, that she gives us the least amount of muscle coordination necessary to turn toward the cake, which is momentarily the object of her interest. In the same way, the way she dips her finger into the cake also conveys 
a minimal amount of effort in order to take a taste on this elaborate cake. Also, the idea that she puts her finger in a cake and, and that, that would serve, say, 15, um, in addition to the other desserts that line the background of the image, um, suggests that this is a kind of wasteful gesture, that she's unconcerned um, with uh, uh, using what is at her, disposable, uh, at her disposal, that she has way too much than is necessary. Also, this moment where she looks at the camera, it's huge, right? Um, and we'll talk about this later in the class, um, what it means for a character to look at the camera and violate the, the central idea that a camera is uh, merely an invisible viewpoint upon the world. But the way she looks at us is an interesting and, and compelling gesture. It kind of feels as if she disdains us in some way, or she says, I see you looking at me and I'm not going to um, change my behavior, right? As if she knows that what the image of what she's doing is in some way um, uh, shameful and that she doesn't care. And it should remind us a bit about the history of, uh, of reclining uh, female figures in the history of painting, and especially this huge one, Manet's Olympia, um, which actually caused a bit of a stir because of uh, partly the way in which uh, the figure of Olympia seemed to uh, challenge uh, with a kind of, uh, of power um, uh, the, uh, the gaze of the spectator by kind of looking back. It wasn't, of course, the first time that female figures, uh, nudes in particular, would look back at the spectator, um, but there was a certain charge to it, and I think that there's something about this image that, that, uh, that conveys a similar feeling. Now, we might also say that the smile at the end of this little clip um, suggests a self-satisfaction, right? She's not smiling until the moment that she looks at us and she gives us the slightest smile um, that she's kind of pleased with herself. We also might think about staging, right? We haven't even uh, said that there's an, another figure in this image, which is the servant. Notice that the servant, um, her back is to us. We don't see her face. We can barely see her face. And in fact, the lighting and costume emphasizes our attention on Marie de-emphasizes our attention on the servant. Notice the way in which the key light is creating highlights on her face and on her dress, which is white, uh, maximizing the reflection and, and thus enhancing our, um, our ability to see her. So what we've done is kind of elaborated the specificity of, of the gesture and, uh, and the mise-en-scene, but what, what can we say about this? I think this opening uh, of the film asks us to think about something very important. Is this the Marie Antoinette of historical myth or of the film? Because I might ask you, um, does this person resemble the person in the film? In many ways, I don't think she does. This person is disdainful. She, la she, she, uh, she is, is wasteful. She delights in her own privilege. Um, this is in many ways the Marie Antoinette, not of the film, but the Marie Antoinette of historical myth the one that said, let them eat cake. And importantly, the film gives us another picture of that Marie once more in the film, and this takes place after we've entered the uh, story proper. And when they went to the queen to tell her her subject had no bread, do you know what she said? Let them eat cake. That's such... And then I'll, I'll, I'll play what she says afterwards. She says, that's such nonsense. And it's important to keep in mind that this image is not an actual one. It's, a, it's an image that is supposed to represent the, uh, the people's picture of Marie Antoinette. And it's actually, it, it, it uh, uh, reinforces that with the phrase, let them eat cake, which historians don't actually uh, attribute to Marie Antoinette, um, even though cultural history um, always attributes it to, to Marie Antoinette. Um, they, a lot of people um, who, who work in history have suggested that that's a fallacious claim. So this is um, giving us this picture of the Marie Antoinette of history, uh, historical myth that is, versus the Marie Antoinette the film is trying to depict, and that they exhibit not only um, a different set of characteristics, but also a different set of costume choices, of behaviors. Uh, notice the facial expression on this Marie, the dark lipstick. Right, the idea of reclining in a tub with jewelry on. This is not something that we'll quite see in the film, even if we'll see um, a lot of uh, indulgence and consumption in the film. 
Um, so I do want to look at um, moving away from gesture, and let's look towards staging. And I want to look at one clip from another film we haven't watched, um, which is just a great example of what staging is. And I want to talk about staging as simply the way in which characters are choreographed in time. And Bordwell and Thompson say, thinking like a filmmaker means to a large extent, finding ways to guide the viewer's eye. In other words, directors direct attention. And I think that's really um, nicely on display in this clip. That's from a film, Rebel Without a Cause, directed by Nick Ray, 1955. And this is the opening scene. So I'm actually going to narrate it as, as it plays. Now what we have here is a, is a camera movement that first gives us the interior of the police station. We know that James Dean is our character because the opening shot that preceded this showed that he was our main character. But we have this other character who's in front of the camera momentarily and then passes by. That might pique our interest and say, who is that person? Can we see him again? We get him for a moment and then we lose him. And then our framing only suggests that there's one point of attention, that's James Dean. But notice the way in which the film... The film is going to um, change uh, the framing through subtle means, not just through editing. Now, right now, our attention is balanced between James Dean's face and this vibrantly red object in his hand, which is a toy. Now, this is a wonderful moment uh, in which uh, no cut or edit has taken place. Simply, James Dean's body has displaced this portion of the frame to reveal a new character. And why do we know that she's a new character? Partly because uh, James Dean looks at her briefly, but also because she's wearing bright red. Uh, and there is a saxophone riff that plays at the moment that he displaces um, that portion of the frame. And now the edit uh, confirms our hypothesis that she would be a central figure. And yet we don't know who she is. Judy, we're ready for you. Now we have a moment in which it's confirmed that she has a story. The camera is going to follow her. And now we have two characters. Uh, we have James Dean's story, which is uh, put on hold for a moment. And we have her story, and she's going to elaborate uh, a few character details that we don't really need to, to get into right now, just to know that what's going on here is the establishment of the relationship between three individuals by focusing our attention on uh, different parts of the frame. And I, what I think is really significant is the way that we weave out of her story. We're in the office with the policeman. We hear her story, which is a kind of melodramatic tale of kind of teen angst. And then we get this wonderful shot that gives us the background that contains, if we will notice it, James Dean once again. If I hadn't made it clear, James Dean um, is drunk and he's kind of been picked up by the police um, after passing out um, on the streets outside. Now we have a nice little sound bridge. Uh, him, uh, he, he's drunk and he's imitating the siren and then it motivates a cut back to his story. Now we see him occupying the center of the frame. Hey. Hey, that's enough static out of you. Cut it out now, I'm warning you. Now this moment is huge. This is the one I want to rest on. We've been introduced to, uh, to, to, one, to one character, we've been introduced to another character, and then that third character that we saw at the beginning is revealed now at more or less the center of the frame. And wonderfully, these three people who will become friends in the story, and the story will revolve around their relationship, are here sharing the same frame, inviting us to think about them um, as both connected and not. And this wonderful moment where this great open space is going to be traversed in an act of empathy, where James Dean character takes off his jacket and gives it to this, to this boy who seems distraught and cold. And the relationship between these three characters is once again confirmed by uh, 
by the woman in red looking back, motivating a cut to her perspective, um, and, and then resting it once again on this composition. That's all I really wanted to establish, that staging is not just a way of conveying kind of symbolic information, but simply directing attention. And in this film that wants to say that there is this kind of organic relationship that emerges between these three characters, that you can almost trace the way the relationship um, happens just by um, positioning them in the frame. Um, the last thing I want to say about uh, staging and framing is uh, the kinds of uh, meaningful interpretations we might make in Marie Antoinette. I only want to look at one pattern of staging and framing in the film, and it's a simple one. It's the one in which Marie um, and, uh, and her husband, the king, um, are arranged when they sit down to eat dinner. This is a kind of ritual in the film that's all about the rituals of the monarchy. And notice the way in which this, this frame conveys a lot of information. It's of course a beautiful frame, it's symmetrically composed. Um, but notice that the centerpiece always figures, uh, serves to divide the two of them, right? They are together at the table, but they rarely interact at, at this moment. And it's a, it's a pattern. Um, because even when the camera draws back in the next iteration of it, we have an object that separates them. And once again, an object that separates them. Once again, an object that separates them. And interestingly, at the moment in which um, all is lost, um, and the kind of um, overconsumption um, and, and wealth of the monarchy is, is fading into ruins, um, that's the moment that this space is breached, um, that there's no centerpiece um, taking up this space and leaving the possibility for Marie uh, and the king to kind of connect. Even if it's not a hugely significant connection, it is one that makes meaning by virtue of its comparison to these barriers that happen throughout the film. So that's all I want to say um, about those two things, and I'll see you uh, next week um, for our next topic, which is cinematography.